most of our configuration is almost complete. What we need to do now is create a plan that our customers will be able to, uh, to purchase goods and services on. We're going to switch over to the plans area. We already have many different plans configured, and you can see that you can have a huge number of products on these plans. I'm just going to select one existing and scroll down here. So you can see that there are many different products included on this plan. We have roaming, we have international calls, we have SMS services, MMS services, voice services, just a whole slew of products available on this plan. We're going to add a new plan to further define how plans work in JBilling. This is the same uh, screen that you would see any time you create a new plan. What we need is a product code. A description. So this is very similar to the setup of our products. We need to define how often we're going to charge for those services. Monthly is typically the sort of standard uh, length of time. We're going to give the plan a rate. So what this defines is that every month the customer is going to be charged $99.99 for whatever products are in this plan. We also have the option to make this plan editable. So what that means is on a purchase order, when we create a purchase order for a customer, we can further edit the details on the plan for the customer. Products. So we want to add some products to our plan because remember a plan is a bundle or group of services. So we're going to go ahead and add an existing product. We didn't create this one but we're going to use it on our plan. We're going to define the bundled quantity as zero because we don't know how much of this product the customer is going to use. That will be defined when we run mediation. We're going to have the customer charge for these services monthly. And we're going to add a different pricing model. So you can see that here it's metered. But we want to assign that to a rate card. These pricing models are the same pricing models that we had available to us in the pricing of the products. We can change this pricing model to anything that we want. The idea here is that if a customer buys the product outside of the bundle or the plan, they are charged 999 euros. But if they buy the product within this plan, the pricing is defined by this rate card. The, and that's the route rate card that we just configured, the 500 voice. So we're going to end up with a different pricing. JBilling has a lot of flexibility when it comes to your pricing, and this is just one of the ways in which it is extremely flexible. So I'm just going to go ahead and quickly add some more products to our, um, our plan here. And again, we're assigning this same product to that same route card, route rate card. Oops. I'm sorry, just bear with me as I finish this. And we can also go ahead and assign that SMS service product that we created earlier. And in this case, let's say we just don't want to change any of the fields. They are correct for the plan. And there we go. Once you have everything configured, you can go ahead and save your changes on that plan. And then it becomes available to us to use and assign to a customer. Again, this was the end of our configuring the system in order to be able to use it and in order for it to be able to mediate our CDRs correctly. So let's start talking about our customers. 
You can see that I have added many different customers into JBilling. Some of them are sub, uh, they have sub accounts. So what we have is very similar to our company structure. We have a parent account that happens to be a company, and then they have a customer beneath them. And we can configure the invoices to be sent to various parties within that structure. We can have an unlimited sort of layering of um, parent-child accounts. What we also have is the ability to group and organize our customers in different account types. So if I select this particular customer, we get a breakdown of their information. But this particular customer has been created in a particular group. We're going to head back to configuration. We're going to take a look at account types. So what account types are is that they, they can define different sort of groups of customers. Now this is specific to um, you know, this scenario where we have wholesale business and we're going to create private, but this could also be different regions. This could be um, you know, different, uh, different brands of, of customers. The idea is that the system gives you the ability to group and organize your customers and then apply different fields to them, different products to them. You can restrict products from belonging to a particular group of uh, account types and so on. And we do that through our meta fields. So it's possible to create meta fields in the system and we'll show you uh, about that in just a moment. But the idea is that when you create your meta fields for your specific account types, they can apply to different customers. So for example, a wholesale customer, Brian and Sarah, they get a particular set of meta fields, they have a particular set of information, they also potentially have a particular set of products that only apply to them. Meanwhile, private only applies to Will, which again has a completely different set of meta fields. Account types can be found in the configuration area under account types. Here you can see that we have business and wholesale. So for example, wholesale, we have a particular setup. So these are account information types, which are also meta fields. So you can see that we have, you know, salutation, first name, short name, last name, tax ID, um, ID type, number. Uh, birth date, payment mode, method, bank information. So there's a lot of different details that you can add to your particular account types. If we look at business, we see that we have a different set. So there are some differences between what we just saw in, um, in our wholesale account type and our business account type. We're going to add a new account type, which uh, based on time, we only really have time to um, assign one meta field or one information type. But what I'm doing right now is I'm creating the standard information that will be assigned to any customer created under this account type. So the name is private, they'll all be on a one month billing cycle, they have this particular invoice design, this particular currency, and so on. I'm now going to create an information type, which is also a meta field. I want to add an email meta field, for example. So I'm going to go ahead and add a new one. And here's where I define my meta field or information type. I have the option to define the data type in many different ways. I could even create lists or enumerations. I can make this mandatory to make sure that it gets filled out. I can define the meta field type, which again, in this case is email, email rule type, and I can also add an, an error message. So if someone does not enter an email address correctly, we get this message. I could go ahead and create many new meta fields or information types. In the interest of time, we're just going to leave it as email. So I now have email successfully added to my account type of private. 
So you can see that I have a completely different set of information types for my private account types compared to business or wholesale. Back to our customer screen now, I'm going to create a new customer. I'm going to select private, and we're going to get the customer screen. So the idea here as well is that JBlin comes with a standard set of, of meta fields or fields that you can fill out. But because each company is very different, we've extended the system to be able to accommodate that. So again, you can assign different fields to different customers. You could also change those static fields like currency, for example. You could change it manually, but ideally it saves you a lot of time for configuring your customers. Here I can define if this customer is a parent account, if it has children accounts beneath it, I can indicate who receives invoices, and there's a lot of other flexibility that you have in configuring your customers. To keep things moving right along, I'm going to define that email meta field that we configured, and we'll define his billing information once we generate an invoice. So I'm going to go ahead and save that information, and we've successfully created a customer a new customer who's going to purchase the services that we've created. So let's go ahead and do that. We're going to create a purchase order. As stated before, the customer per is the one purchasing the goods and services. That could be a parent account, a child account, whoever it is that is using those services. The purchase order defines whether you know, how long the services are active for, how often do we bill for those services, is it prepaid or postpaid, do these services end at any time. What we can add on our purchase order is products or plans, we can add discounts, we can have suborders, and we can make changes to those orders and have those changes um, identified. So we're going to take a closer look at our discounts and suborders as well as we go ahead and create a purchase order for Will Patterson now. I'm at his customer screen, and we just created him, and I can go ahead and create an order for him. I also could make a payment and do other types of uh, functionality as well. Here we have a purchase order. So we need to define the details. So that's the things like, you know, how often are we billing the customer for these monthly? We're going to charge them immediately for the services. When do the services start? We're going to go back a few months. And now we want to add products and plans. So we want to add the plan that we just created for the system, which is the Telco Gold plan. So I'm going to go ahead and add that now. We can get a breakdown of those services. That's great. I also want to assign a, an asset. So remember when we configured um, we configured the asset for this particular product at the beginning of this presentation. Because this product has assets, I get this screen available to me and I have to pick an asset, or I don't have to, but in, in this case I have to pick an asset for this customer for this product. So I'm picking the one that we added earlier. Add that to our order as well. And the reason why I have to do that is because again our mediation is linked to this information on that the customer is subscribed to. We're going to review the order, make sure that we have all the products that we want. So at this point we could edit some information if we wanted to. We don't in this case. And one final thing that I'm going to do is add the discount that we added earlier. Now here's where I'm going to show you the flexibility. I get to select the discount that I want to apply, so let's say the 10% discount. But then I have to define to what level does that discount apply to. Does it only apply to the asset or the inventory product? Does it apply only to the plan? Or is it an order, le order level discount? Does it apply to everything on the order? 
if you had more products, you could apply it to several, many different products, and so on. So there's a lot of flexibility in, in how you define a discount for your customer's services. So I'm going to say order level discount. And you can see, if I use this green plus sign, I could add other discounts to this order as well. I'm going to go ahead and save this order now because we've finished defining it. And once it saves, it will be added to all the other orders in the system. Now, you'll notice that our orders have this parent-child um, field here. And that's because the discount that we created is associated to this the subscriptions that we made. So the system wants to make an association between the two so that I can't delete this order without deleting the other order as well. We're basically creating a link between orders that are associated to each other. If I go to the order screen, we'll see that better defined. So we have two orders for Will. One is the subscription services, so monthly starting on November 1st for a total of $99.99. We have the Telco Gold Plan and we have that MSI SDN uh, inventory product as well. The second is our one-time discount. So it calculates the discount on our, on our, um, our initial invoice, oh sorry, our initial purchase order from uh, what we saw on, on uh, this order here. So let's say that this customer um, has, not, has not had an invoice generated for them yet and they're a little bit behind the billing process, but we need an invoice for them right away. So what we would do in that case is manually generate an invoice for our customer. And I can do that by clicking on this Generate, generate Invoice button. So now we have an invoice, but we don't have that other order included. We don't have that discount, discount order included. So what I can do as well is manually apply to invoice. So this is the discount order. I can manually apply it to the invoice that we just created for the services. So now this order is finished because it's been invoiced, and that's a discount order. If we take a look at the invoice generated, we'll see that we have a consolidated invoice with those two orders on it, and we have a price that the customer needs to pay. So I'm showing you this example as a way to prove that JBilling can handle manually in generated invoices. In just a moment, we'll take a look at a automated, autom an automatically generated invoice. Before we do that, though, we do want to get this invoice paid. I'm going to click on the Pay Invoice button on our invoice. Now, ideally, this could happen automatically. As soon as the invoice is generated, it can be a, a payment can be triggered. But if a customer is providing a payment, um, you know, through a portal, uh, or they call uh, uh, your your customer service and say, "I want to give you my credit card information," you can do that manually as well. What we are going to do is process the payment in real time. So we're going to provide a credit card or credit card information for this customer. And this is actually going to access or trigger an automatic payment. We have a automatic, uh, or so we have a payment gateway plugin configured that will process fake credit cards. And we use this for our demonstrations so that we don't actually charge anyone for payments. So I clicked on the review payment button. That gives me the ability to review my payment before officially making the payment. And once that finished, we'll see that the payment method was done in, by Visa. We have the details of the payment authorization. So you can see that fake processor was triggered here. And we have the credit card information. Most importantly, we have an invoice that is associated or linked to the payment. That payment is available on the invoice as we're looking at it right now. 
So we can see that it was a successful payment. And the invoice status changes to paid, so the customer does not owe us anything further on this particular invoice. At this time, we can also download a PDF. So how do you send your invoices to customers? You can download a PDF file. The customer can see this as well if they're looking through um, the JBilling user interface or if you integrate uh, using an API. This is just a sample, a very, very simple sample example of an invoice. JBilling can also email automatically those invoices to your customers. So that is also a possibility. Um, so again, you can either print and mail the invoices to the customers by generating PDFs or email it to the customer um, via notifications. That being said, you wouldn't have to download each individual PDF file. You would have a, a file that has all of your PDF files in it so that you could print them all at one time or send them to a printer, for example. Okay. At this point, our customer has been billed for the first month of services, but during the month of November, they're also using the services, the usage, right? They're using the services that are detailed on their um, on the plan that they have. So at this point, I'd like to show you a mediation process. We're back at the mediation screen, and this is the mediation uh, that we configured earlier. And I mentioned that I was going to upload a file. So this is the file that I'm going to upload again. But I want to talk a little bit more about some of the fields here. We already defined where that date field is. The quantity is also defined. So in this case, it's going to be 333. In this case, it's 26, and so on. We also have to define the asset that is used. So this is the asset that we configured for our customer, 30152404. So this is what defines what customer is using the services. And again, this is for this particular configuration and setup. We also have the prefix. So the prefix for the product. So we saw that on the data table. There were prefixes for the product. Here's a different one. Now there's a lot more information here, but as a high level overview, those are the key fields that we need in order to successfully process mediation. So again, I'm just going to go ahead and upload that file. And I'm going to save my changes. When you say whenever a mediation process runs, we're going to get a information field saying that we have a mediation process running. All of our mediation processes are going to run under the mediation tab. Now, the mediation process hasn't finished quite yet. We don't have an end date or time on it. Um, this is, you know, we basically just have to wait for this to finish. Typically, it doesn't take very long. Um, you know, you can process hundreds of thousands or thousands of thousands of CDRs in a matter of, matter of seconds. Um, so we're just going to hang tight for one second. But what we're going to expect to see is a breakdown of the billable information. So we're going to get files that are done and billable, some that are done and not billable. So in the case where I said, you know, in calls less than 10 seconds don't have any charges associated. Also, if there's any errors declared or detected in the what you're trying to process as well. So there we go. We have our total records processed. So in this case, we do have two errors that are de detected. We can see those records. Uh, we can define which ones were not uh, actually processed, and then you can take those and reprocess them again once they're, they're uh, configured correctly. We do have ones that are done and billable, which is great. We can also see those records, and then we get a total amount that was processed. What's really important here are the orders that are affected. So the ultimate goal of the mediation process is to 
define the information that are, is in the CDRs, look into J-Billing, so everything that we've configured in J-Billing, the products, the pricing, uh, the plans, what is the customer subscribed to. We also look at the data tables and the route rate cards, and by filtering through all that information, we get billable information that is, is something that we can understand to bill the customer. We can see that this was created by a mediation process, and we can see that we have the three products that we added to our plan for our customer, the other national mobile calls, national fixed calls, outgoing SMS, and we have the rates ap applied. So we saw that quantity, 333, that's available here as well. We can view these events and how they were processed. And that order is added to our orders pane and is now ready to be billed to the customer. So in order to bill our customer, we now want to use our billing process. So we want to do, generate automatic billing for our customer. I'm going to go to configuration and billing process. So ideally what our billing process is doing is that it's taking the purchase order and it's determining whether or not to generate an invoice from it. And then the invoice that's generated is based on the design that we've configured. So you already saw a very simple example of an invoice design. We'll talk a little bit more about that in just a second. But what we want to see here in this invoice is the monthly services charged in advance for the customer, so $99.99, plus the mediated services that we just generated through medi the mediation process. I'm going to run the mediation. That's okay. We'll talk about this in just a second. So bear with me as I just do one configuration item. I'm running the billing process manually. This is because we don't want to wait around for the billing process to run. It will happen automatically. It is scheduled to run, much like our mediation process. Both of those can be configured through plugins in the plugin area of the system. I've also generated a review report. If we go back to billing, what we'll see is this, first of all, we'll see any previous billing run that has been done. But we'll also see this particular billing run that's done in italics. And we have these approve and disapprove buttons. And what this review process allows us to do is review the invoices before they're sent out to customers. So if I click on Show Invoices, we'll see that the status is Review. Nothing has been sent to our customers. I'm looking for that invoice that we created for Will. And here it is. And you can see it's a consolidated invoice. We have the two orders. We have the um, the sorry, excuse me, the asset product, the plan product, plus our mediated data. Everything looks correct, so what we want to do is to go back to our review report, approve it, so that we can go ahead with our regular billing. We could also disapprove it. If anything looked a little strange, if it looked like uh, customers weren't being invoiced properly, and typically that happens because of uh, human error, then you can go back and fix that. I'm going to run the billing process again so that we get an official billing run. And at this point, your invoices would be sent to your customers. So those buttons are missing now. Let's take a look at those invoices. We now can see whether they're paid or unpaid instead of review. And Will Patterson has his invoice. It's exactly the same as the review invoice that we saw earlier. He can go ahead and pay that invoice um, to rec reconcile his account. Now, for invoices, I want to show you that we can generate more complex invoices. What we use is Jasper Reports. And it's basically a template. And we can configure it to look 
you know, as simple or as complex as you like. This is a very, this is a uh, invoice that's actually generated by one of our customers. You can have graphics, images. Most importantly, you can show the breakdown of the usage that was made during the month. And you can have multiple pages. If you were using sub-accounts, you could generate an invoice that showed the breakdown of each sub-account for that parent account. And that would be generated in a single invoice for the customer. So you could potentially have an invo invoice that's, you know, 20 plus pages. Now we are sort of running out of time, so I want to finish up here. I do want to add that it is possible to do upgrades and downgrades with JBilling. That is standard functionality. Uh, we can do prorating, which helps with our upgrades and downgrades. So if a customer upgrades mid-month, that's possible. And that's all defined by the way that you configure your purchase order.